You're listening to iCannabisRadio.com. All right, we are back. We actually had technical difficulties last week, and so our guest from last week, Miss Larissa Bolivar, was gracious enough to come back and spend time with us again. Samantha couldn't make it today, but welcome, Larissa. Hello. Um, and uh, Larissa, you're a busy lady. That's putting it. <laughs> uh, first of all, I want to say that you, you've been, you know, a huge marijuana activist for quite some time now. Since what? What was the first year you started doing this? Well, technically, high school in D.C., going to the National Smoke In, which is happening tomorrow. Right on. And then I moved to Colorado in 2001, and that same year I met Ken Gorman, and that's when I got involved gotcha. in this crazy thing. And you founded the Cannabis Consumers Union. That, yeah, we launched in April. Mm-hmm. I've owned other organizations prior to that, mm-hmm. uh, one called the Colorado Compassion Club, and we were one of the first dispensaries in the state pre-1284. Pre-1284. So yeah. that was the real Wild West. That was the real Real, it's a book, dude. It's a book. Uh, it is, it should totally. Be. Um, it was a real Wild West. Backpackers and, coming in. Oh, my God. Nonstop. I thought everybody was a cop. Because I'm like, who are you? <laughs> Why are you here with your backpack? Yeah. Why do you have a beard? Yeah, <laughs> right. Why didn't you shower today? <laughs> well, I know most of them showered. There Nobody was really stinky. But, the, yeah, the beard and, like, coming out of nowhere, right. you know. Offering to sell weed, but not wanting to sign up as a caregiver. So I'm like, why well, not? Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> hmm. Where did this come from? <laughs> so. Yeah, but yeah. no longer doing that. Mm-mm. No, yeah. no. Um, and why did you decide to start the uh, Cannabis Consumers Union? Well, I saw a need for consumer advocacy. Um, you know, other organizations have started, you know, they started as that, like Normals won 40 years ago and have evolved into like lobbying arms and political action committees. And I noticed that while I was at the Capitol, um, all the lobbying was being done for industry. There mm-hmm. really wasn't that many people representing the individual consumer in this dialogue. And we're the ones that get impacted the most by these laws. Absolutely. And you know, we're the ones that fought for these laws, not just industry. Most of the people that I advocated with and you know were activists back in the day Well, they were patients then and caregivers, but they were individual consumers. They weren't representing industries. So it was time. It was time. Cool. Now, what are some of the platforms that you guys are focusing on right now? Uh, We're we're like your typical consumer advocacy watchdog. So we look out for price gouging, uh, quality control, pesticides. Um, We want to be sure that chemicals aren't being used. Uh, We're Mm -hmm. anti-GMO. We really push for organic. Uh, uh, You know, that's, that's... the trend for the future, and I stand behind organic products. I've always grown organic, and I don't want people poisoning themselves. Nobody should want that, really. Um, and then any other things that might impact the consumer industry moves that might impact the consumer or the industry. Um, so call to actions, you know, we'll be doing testing products, you know, which is a fun job. <laughs> that, that is a fun job. It actually is not as fun as some people think. Well, I, 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 I need to amend that. I used to be a product tester for edibles <laughs> before job. they were testing. You know what I mean? Oh. Before, So you didn't know what you were going to get. I'd be like, so how much is in here? And they'd be like, um, it could be 100 milligrams. It could be 200 milligrams. And you're just like, um, okay, let me not plan anything for the next day and a half if I'm testing this. Oh, uh, you know? yeah. 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 I had a, a very intense trip once. A friend of mine made brownies. And she's like, you know, I had a couple ounces of shake left and I made brownies. She's like, so, you know, be careful when you eat that. And of course, you know, I was like in my 20s, didn't think very wisely then. And I ate the whole thing. Of course. And my battery died in my phone. And I was at home with no car in a new house with boxes. Mm. It was interesting. A little paranoia setting yeah. in. Not Maureen Dowd. <laughs> Not Maureen Dowd. Okay. <laughs> because you can handle your cannabis more than Maureen Dowd. Yes. Can. A, and, yeah. And I didn't have anything to write with. Right, right. <laughs> like, there's nothing to write with right now. Oh, God. Uh, that's funny. Yeah. We, I've, had, I've definitely had some, some diff some bad experiences as well. <laughs> but I think that's all going with knowing what the dose is. You know, so whenever when someone's like, oh man, I don't like edibles because I had a homemade brownie, I'm always like, yeah, you might want to try like real, like a, a medical brownie. A medical brownie. Yeah. And so, for example, one of the things that I really stood behind, um, testified for and supported was, um, well, education. I'm big on education, huge on education. And there's some wonderful trade groups that are growing out of this movement that are teaching uh, industry workers and 
uh, hopefully soon consumers, mm-hmm. um, on these things. One of the things we're pushing for is educating bud tenders mm-hmm. so that they can tell people, you know, the differences in um, between concentrates and then edibles and how they impact your body because edibles metabolize differently. And then another thing I'm advocating for is the 10 milligram dosage. However, I think that there should also be the option for 50 or 100 because just like it's not fair for a consumer that can only handle 10 milligrams, Mm -hmm. which I am actually one of those people, I discovered 10 is a perfect dose for me to be able to still function and stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, It's also not, so, you know, I can buy one, but it would be completely unfair for a consumer to have to buy 10, 10 milligram items as well. So, you know, there has to be variety. Well, yeah. And like our sponsors, and I'm actually big fans of them. So I I mean, I always tout them, but it's not just because they're sponsors, but Incredibles uh, made by Medically Correct. They do 100 milligram bars and they're divided into like 12 pieces. So three pieces is 25 milligrams. Nice. Um, that's my dosage that I like, you know, and I can go higher, but I like to be a little more functioning usually, yeah. you know, unless I'm in a lot of pain, but you know, so I like that I can break it up cause it's like a Hershey's bar kind of feel. And then you can break it up and I can dose myself that way. But then also I like the fact that sometimes, oh, well maybe I don't want to dose myself that much. You know, maybe I just want a little bit of relief or if a friend comes over and like, I want to try an edible, I'm like, okay, I'm going to break off one piece. This yeah. is like eight and a third of milligrams. Why don't you try this and tell me how you feel, you know, and, and I'll work on their dosing with them. Um, so if you don't have something like available, like what Incredibles offers in that aspect, it does make it difficult for somebody like, oh, well, now I got to go back to the store and I got to go buy another 10 milligrams or I got to buy two pieces. So I agree with you. I think it would be nice to create that variety. Oh, sure. Yeah. And it'll be good for industry. I think right now what they might be worried about and what I would be worried about as a business owner is costs. And unfortunately, with the marijuana industry, and it's easy to, to go down the slippery slope of costs, it's very expensive. Right. And so now, you know, if people, Incredibles might be looking at this, but, you know, paying 30000 or more for molds, each mold, mm-hmm. to be able to stamp um, the THC amount of milligrams sure. that are, you know, in the bar. But then, you know, at the same time, by creating variety and by marking things and showing um, stewardship and uh, responsibility is actually a good thing because, you know, overall it looks good. Our, the way we reacted to the, you know, because these edible incidences were cast a dark light on on the, on us. However, the way we responded was so quick. Yes. You know, we were like, okay, well, you know, we really don't want this to happen. How can we make it better? Well, the big thing for me, you know, on these edible quote unquote incidences is, <laughs> is that, you know, I have a, more of the problem I think comes from the way the media is the mainstream media, because I guess we are media, but we're more niche media. <laughs> and, but the mainstream media is portraying these as they they latch onto it. They don't go, they don't look at it more in depth and go, okay, well, was there alcohol in this person's system? Was there mental problems for this person before sure. they took the, the edibles? I mean, that that those things were present in they were. In, the, in the gentleman who shot his wife, and it was like, well, why isn't that focused on first? No, instead you want to say, oh, there was marijuana in the system. Oh yeah. Like, yeah, we're the devil. We are. Yeah, we're the devil. It's, we still are. There's still the element of reefer madness. You know, we we ourselves as consumers live in this bubble and things are great for us right now. History is being made. Mm -hmm. Things are happening that we didn't think in a million, you know, that a million years would happen so quickly. It it is happening fast. It's very, very fast. But, you know, we forget. And it's not many anymore, but they're well paid. You know, organizations like Smart Colorado and Project Sam. (laughs) That's an oxymoron. (laughs) I know. Just calling them Smart Colorado. I know. I know. I want to invite them over my house and like, because I'm, you know, I'm also getting my master's in policy and my concentration is mar- uh, national marijuana, national and international marijuana policy. So how do you get to do a concentration in that? Are they the school? Where do you go? Where are you going? Regis. By Regis. And they allowed you to cr- kind of create that? Uh-huh. I'm designing it. I had to sell them on the idea um, uh-huh. because, you know, they underwrite the degrees and, you know, but they've been friendly to the marijuana community. They've had uh, medical marijuana events there in the past and I started my bachelor's there and they gave me credit for the work I did as a caregiver mm. towards social work, believe it or not. So so I got my bachelor's in psychology because I worked with a lot of patients and gotcha. so it you know, it was it was still pretty you know, a hard sell because it's bringing the spotlight on them, you know. However, I told them that they have to, you know, I suggested, I didn't tell them forcefully. Right. 
um, that they had to take a position on this. The history is changing in Colorado, and they're an international institution because they're a Jesuit school. Mm-hmm. And, you know, th- there has to be some sort of body of research. And some, you know, th- some people have written their theses, and I don't know if any of their dissertations through the school on cannabis related issues, mm-hmm. but, you know, this is really digging in deep into all of the areas of, you know, this historical change. So, wow. um, Anyhow, I want to invite these people, you know, Project Sam and Smart Colorado, to read some of my work and see some of my books. And, you know, I mean, I'm like, I I feel like a hamster. I'm always reading, reading, writing, writing, reading, reading, right, you know, on a wheel. And But all this information that's coming out, I hope that it does help impact them. We'll see. We'll see. They're pretty biased. I (laughs) I would love to say that that could happen, but I think that they're kind of in that uh, purview where, um, well, first of all, there are special interests, uh, you know, sure. behind Smart Colorado. Oh, yeah. So, uh, you know, it's like one of those things, like no matter how right you might be, no matter how many facts <laughs> you're going to put in front of them. I, I look at them as akin to the people who were like, you know, the the 1% of scientists that are like, there's no evidence of climate change, <laughs> you know? And it's like, uh, no, no, no. It's like right here in front of you. Let me like bang it on your head. And they're like, that's not, ha- don't feel it. Don't feel it. Not happening. <laughs> cool in here. Yeah. Yeah. No, no. You know, it, it's funny. Like every time it gets cold, they're like, oh, we had a lot of snow. See, there's no global warming it's like yeah it doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way it doesn't work that way Uh -uh. but i think that's that i look at them as the same way yeah you know um, they're constantly looking for something to um to support their opinions no matter how outlandish it is no matter whether it's real news or fake news because i know they've done that before they'd latch onto some fake news story like see look at this and it's like ah yeah that was the onion that was the onion. oh yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) sorry it doesn't work that way um yeah so i i I applaud you and keep trying definitely um but i have reached out to them and i you know i've 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 spoken with rachel Mm o'brien um and you know because she was interested to see that somebody was actually advocating on behalf of consumers and for public safety and sure. not industry. Like, that stunned her. And so she wanted to have a conversation with me. And she bo- she and I both acknowledge that um, we're on opposite sides of the fence mm-hmm. and we might disagree with things. But then, you know, she was really uh, appreciative of uh, me suggesting education uh, and really pushing for that. And, you know, other people have been pushing for that as well. Um, but... I think she likes that that image of responsibility, but by no means is she coming over to our side. Well, of course, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This it's not going to happen. It's yeah. Happen. So, well, the the big thing I've been hearing that they're concerned with now, and I've I've actually seen illusions of this from the governor and the May, and Mayor Hancock here in Denver, um, is their the public perception of the safety of marijuana is like, it's now being perceived as not as dangerous as it was. And it's like, Oh, you mean, so people are learning the truth, (laughs) you know? I mean, that's what cracks me up about it is like, they're saying, Oh, well, we're, we're worried that people are now perceiving that it's a a safer substance. It's like, Uh, it is a safer substance. Yeah. So, okay. So you're worried that people are learning the truth. That's what you're basically telling me. I don't, it's so crazy to me because I don't, what really just drives me crazy is everybody's fear of something that has a psychoactive property, but yet they're perfectly happy taking Xanax mm-hmm. and they're perfectly happy taking oxycodones Ambien. and Vicodin, Ambien. Ambien is freaky. A it's I crazy. know I had a panic attack on Ambien. You did? Oh, yeah. Uh, I had, anything I was, that makes somebody wake up, <laughs> not wake up actually, sleep cook. <laughs> That's crazy to me. Like, I mean, how are you, you you're, they like wake, they, they get up, they go, they cook an omelet, have no, res, you know, what if they had a gas oven and they didn't realize, I mean, you could blow you, yourself up you on Ambien. do anything on Ambien. Exactly. That, I mean, like, what if you kill somebody on Ambien? I mean, exactly. Like, let's think about the more dangerous. And, and some of these pharmaceuticals, you know, they are deadly. Mm-hmm. They do kill people. On a regular basis. On a regular basis. Yeah. Yeah. And so, what is it, like 19 people a day or something? It's mm-hmm. pretty pretty mm-hmm. high. Mm-hmm. So, you know, but they're completely psychoactive and they're highly intoxicating, but you don't have people being pulled over and testing for Vicodin. No. You know, I've recovered from surgery. You know, I can't, I can't do anything on those things. I prefer not to take them. Mm-hmm. And so people have this fear of taking a substance that's going to be psychoactive and alter their mind, but yet they do it all the time. You yeah. know, whether it's drinking, you know, food, mm-hmm. you know, f- certain foods like uh, bread releases like dopamine mm-hmm. and feel good hormones that people don't realize that they start becoming addicted to food. 
that's a psychoactive impact because it's changing your brain chemistry. So, you know, the science is just the fact that they're, you know, it is, it's frustrating. You're right. It it's is. just like battling climate change. Well, and, and then you have the perception side of things where it, it's, it's amazing how blind some people are. And I'm going to pick on our governor because I love to. <laughs> and he, he makes himself such an easy target. He's, he was he was interviewed by Katie Couric, um in, in Aspen just last week. And uh, I think it was last week. And uh, one of the things that she asked him, she's like, have you tried cannabis? And he, and he kind of smiled. And he's like, no, because I don't want to give off that. I don't want to create a bad message. And I'm like, okay, but you're the same <laughs> governor who put a tap system into the governor's mansion. <laughs> You don't see you a problem don't. with that? You know? No, I don't want to send off a bad message to our young. And it's like, first of all, dude, our young don't care what you do. Yeah. Let's, let's you know, let that go. Yeah. You know, half of them probably don't even know that you're the governor. Yeah, true. You know, they don't care. They don't care. Um, but I just think it's hysterical when they say when they say things like that. I'm just like, you don't even know what you just said. Yeah. You well, don't even get it. I post, you know, I posted something about that today on Facebook because it's almost like he lives in an alternate universe. Oh, totally. It's crazy. I'm like, you don't see how ridiculous you look. Colorado just, the news, the news just, you know, st- stated that Colorado ranks the highest in alcohol deaths. And there's almost 100, there's 88,000 deaths a year. Mm-hmm. We rank number one. He and put then a tap like, system in the governor's Yeah, I'm like, what the hell? <laughs> What is wrong with you? Like, Ridiculous. <laughs> does man. your staff hate you? Do they like manipulate everything before you see it? Because I don't know. I would be embarrassed if I were governor I would by be now. Absolutely embarrassed. You know, one of his platforms is jobs, mm-hmm. and yet marijuana is the industry that's created the most jobs in the state. We've yep. got almost ten thousand jobs, mm-hmm. and yet and it's growing and it's growing. Yeah, like exponentially. It's not, it's not slowing down. It's not down. slowing down at all. It's, no, no. It's like next year we're going to be like, here's twenty five thousand jobs that have been created. You know, and it's like. Yeah, well, I want to create jobs, but not for that. And then and then he'll make the argument like fracking creates jobs. And it's like, no, it doesn't because all the people that work on the fracking jobs are brought in from other places. Yeah, exactly. So you're not actually even giving jobs yeah, to people here. because we're not educating people on how to frack. And, you know, honestly, the controversy surrounding fracking and what it does to the water, you know, like seriously, <laughs> the- you want to talk about – Marijuana being bad, right? right? I, what I, and I love, again, that, you know, well, there's just not enough study on the effects of marijuana, even though they've tried to find negative effects in the last century. Um, <laughs> hundred years. But there's plenty of study that fracking is safe. That's right. what I love hearing. I'm like, yeah, but no. No, it's no, not. There's not. What about the people that are, you know, turning on their water They're and lighting, lighting it on the, fire? <laughs> that cracks you up. They're like, that's no evidence. No, it's not evidence. It's all people in these around the wells, and they're, like, able to light their water on fire. It's a conspiracy. Yeah, it's a conspiracy. <laughs> no, they're putting propane underneath their their water faws. You know, it's just, it's it's amazing. And it's like, it's like a, I don't know, you know what Occam's right, um, theory is? Yes. Right? <laughs> you know. The, it's like that. It's, yeah. yeah, the most likely explanation <laughs> is, is probably it. Right there. Yeah, it's what it is. Um, <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, it's just ridiculous. So um, I want to talk about PTSD with you. Okay. And I think it's fitting that we do discuss PTSD, seeing that it is Independence Day tomorrow. Yes. Um, and uh, I know it's something that you like to you focused on, and uh, was not uh, the outcome you wanted recently uh, no. at the state. But uh, can you talk more about um, what you were working on on the PTSD side for our vets? Well, it's not just for our vets, but that's who you think of when you think of PTSD. Yeah, when people think PTSD naturally. And you know what? It's not really a bad thing that they think veterans because they're probably the most underserved when it comes to PTSD. Um, there you have 22 people killing themselves a day. And that is unacceptable. Oh, absolutely. And um, I consider that a terminal illness. Mm-hmm. And uh, escalating one. And so uh, I myself have PTSD. And um, I... It's it's it, it was exasperated by my involvement in you know the drug movement and mm-hmm. getting safe access for marijuana. Again, it was wild wild west and at some points very dangerous and life threatening. Sure. And um, but that didn't you know that didn't really affect me. It didn't I didn't start getting symptoms of that till 2008. I had PTSD prior to that from childhood trauma. So I, you know mine just got worse. But mm-hmm. because I had PTSD back in the day, quote unquote. Um, once I started helping patients, I noticed that a lot of my patients were ca- were veterans, whether they were from um, Vietnam or slowly trickling in from Iraq and Afghanistan. Were you based in Colorado Springs? No, I was up here in You were Denver. up here, okay, just curious. Yeah, and so, um, you know, and I just started hearing their stories and, you know, the lack of support at the um, VA. 
you know, my uncle or, well, I have a lot of family that were in the military. My granddad fought in Korea. And um, I have experience with the Veterans Administration not being that great. And, you know, I thought that it was a big disservice. So back then, um, I had to hostily take over the Colorado Compassion Club for my ex-husband. It was founded in my EIN and he was under my, you know, Social Security and he was acting in, uh, just bad. And so I took over the business and dissolved it. And I wanted to rebuild it as a dispensary or an organization that was solely was helping patients with PTSD. Like, I just wanted to f- narrow in on that because I was, you know, I, I was witnessing, you know, miracles where people were calling me in, in, in terrible states if they even remember to call me, you know, they'd smoke marijuana, start calming down. And, you know, I knew what it did for me. But then now, now it's different because my PTSD is very similar. You know, I was in situations that were kind of similar to combat situations where gangs were shooting at me and I didn't know what was, you know, I mean, it, like literally mm-hmm. urban warfare. And so I wake up now in the middle of the night um, with nightmares and I get flashbacks so bad that I get vertigo. And marijuana has single handedly saved my life. Like on so many, like when I get triggered, I get, you know, and I think a lot of people go through this and I was talking to a veteran about this. They suffer from the same type of uh, symptoms where, you know, you get triggered, something triggers you, and then you start thinking about what, you know, that trauma, that moment in trauma. And then you start thinking, well, was it worth it? You know, and then you start getting into this depression where that's, I think, what starts triggering the suicide because Mm. it's a nonstop trigger and then it's a deep depression of why did I, you know, why? And then you're in this vicious cycle. And you're in this vicious cycle. And I noticed that when I smoke marijuana and I exercise, that's, you know, why I'm in my gym clothes, Mm. um, it is like the best medicine ever. I was on SSRIs, nearly died, and uh, Xanax, nearly died, and, you know, literally had a breakdown when I withdrew from them. I will never take those things again. I think that, you know, they're misunderstood still, even though there's data supporting, there's also data supporting the dangers, and the dangers are just not worth it. I've noticed that marijuana, no matter how bad I feel, if I can get myself to the gym and I chief out before I smoke and work out or do something that uh, elevates my adrenaline Mm -hmm. in a healthy way, I feel better, Mm -hmm. you know, and, you know, I can carry on my day. I don't get into that depression. I hate getting into that depression. And so whatever I can do to avoid that. And then I hate that feeling of anxiety that happens when you do get triggered, you know, or... um, well, that alone, that marijuana helps. The dizzy, the dizzy spell is not necessarily because you just don't know. I don't know when those are going to happen. It just um, happens sometimes. It, yeah, yeah. I'll start, yeah. But you attribute it to PTSD. Oh, it is totally to Whether PTSD. it's emotional or not, it's just mm-hmm. a physical reaction. Huh? It is. Well, because I'll think, you know, something something will trigger. And the thing is, is you never know what your triggers are. It could be something so random, an article that you glance, you know, or a fleeting thought, you know. Uh-huh. Um, you know, think about... Uh, some of the people that hurt me and, and, you know, and um, then I'll, you know, get kind of panicky for a second and then I'll get dizzy. And, you know, at those moments, uh, I'll pick up, you know, a a bowl or or a roll of joint and it'll help. But what it really, truly helps me for is when I start getting into that dark space. And I'm really, you know, affected by it. Like I'm able to start an organization, you know, work, uh, full-time consulting, doing, you know, marketing and communication well, yeah, You're stuff. a highly functioning <laughs> human being already. Going to school yeah. full-time, 4.0 yeah. GPA, you know, like it's, and so, yeah. So what I want to do with all of that is continue helping everybody with PTSD, women who suffer from trauma. We brought up climate change. Some people don't think it's happening. I just came back from working at an energy company for five years. I can tell you it is happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, it is a national security issue. It is, you know, we might face people, mass migrations and issues that might create trauma, these freak storms and these, you know, more hurricanes. Um, I think that if we study marijuana, you know, intensively as something that could help people deal with, you know, any type of trauma, environmental, you know, rape women, you know, have a lot of trauma that they deal with that. So it's... But, you know, primarily, of course, veterans and, um, you know, they, the disservice that's being done to them is just unacceptable. And I was really, really upset when I testified and the reaction I got from some of the representatives, uh, Representative uh, Conti, I don't remember what district she's in, but she literally had uh, like a patentable, and I, I, don't be mad when I say this, bitch face. It was like she was just disdainful and 
thought we were all ridiculous and we're talking about people dying, 22 people killing themselves a day. And um, she went as far as saying, so uh, Representative Singer, who introduced the bill, asked the committee why they passed a bill allowing people to use non-FDA approved drugs that were still being tested as medicine, but not marijuana. And she actually said, well, those people are terminal or terminally ill. And I mean, I did this. I, I don't normally get like dramatic in hearings. I don't want to be known as the activist mm-hmm. and like, but I did the sign of the cross. I just couldn't, that was the Latina background in me. I just couldn't help it. I was like, oh my God, we're sitting here talking one person after another. One guy was on like the search team for Saddam Hussein. So credible people. He started a mental health business, like a organization to help veterans and like, so credible people. And she just, and her reasoning, her son's a heroin addict and marijuana is a gateway drug. I'm like, really? You really, marijuana is a gateway drug. No, prohibition, prohibition is a gateway, is a gateway drug. drug. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it drives me crazy whenever I hear it as a gateway drug. And, and, and enough, there's enough evidence out there to show that it's actually, if it, if you want to call it a gateway drug, yeah, it can be the gateway away from addiction, uh, 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 like of heroin and substances like that, where somebody can say, well, look, I can take marijuana and it actually takes my edge off of my addiction for heroin, so that I can get away from it. So are there I, are a lot of people that will testify to that. There's um, an advocate out there uh her name is belita nelson she used to I work know belita well. i love belita She's awesome. oh my god we I did a we did woman. a feature piece on her in our last august yes, issue that's where i that's that's where i actually called her from that article did you really yeah i love that yeah because her kurt like i knew i was like damn this woman has courage mm-hmm. and so brave i you know i actually come ironically from a law enforcement background my mom worked uh for a police department mm-hmm. for their vice narcotics unit she doesn't anymore um, but for 30 years. And yeah. really the only reason why I didn't become a police officer was because I was opposed to drug war and I started smoking pot in high school when I was like 14, 15. And it actually helped me get good grades. And I knew then, and I just, you know, was too probably selfish. I just didn't want to be one. Right. And so, you know, I had a lot of head butting with my mom, mm-hmm. but, you know, the people that were in her unit actually, you know, she's an admin, and they were saying, you know, not to stress about it because what, you know, what I was involved in in Colorado was legal, you know, it's medical. And she still didn't really support me, but she, after she met my patients, and at the time when I had, you know, when I started as a caregiver, my first patients were the first few hundred patients on the registry. Mm-hmm. And some of them are dead now. And at the time, you know, they were really chronically ill. And my mom's like, oh, this isn't a party. I'm like, why would mm-hmm. I risk you know, I used to be in staffing. Why would I risk everything for a party? That's why I hate so, the term recreational, too, on top of that. I mean, yes, I've used it, you know, and in short, you say rec, but, like, you know, we try to use adult use and social use because when you say recreational, it just sounds like we're all talking about having a party. Mm-hmm. Not saying you can't have a party right. with cannabis, but it's like it doesn't mean that that's the only goal. You know, and with, you know, recreational, there are vets who are able to get medicine now, albeit more expensive because it's under the adult use side. Um, But I think that was the whole point of what you were doing was you were like, let's get PTSD on the registry for um, what you can get a a marijuana license for here in Colorado so you can get it. Well, the thing is with that is, you know, and I was talking to a doctor about this the other day is, you know, if you're going and you're self-medicating, that defeats the purpose. Like there Mm -hmm. really needs to be a bona fide doctor patient relationship and then you know at that point we can start documenting things too you really don't you know bud tenders are like bartenders you know and then and pharmacists and pharmacists yeah yeah. and so but you know they're it's one or the other really Mm -hmm. because when you're talking about medicine then you're talking about you know things that really a professional medical person needs to be managing. I I, I agree to an extent, but I do think that there's an inherent difficulty in the nature of what cannabis is. Um, there is a lot of knowledge to focus on just cannabis when it comes, okay, well, what strain works best for you? And like what, you know, yes, you need a balance of this much indica and this much sativa for yours. Um, it's a lot for a doctor to learn who's already kind of in their system. Yeah, that's you know what a good I mean? point. Um, where, because I, you know, I've heard a lot of people say, well, why don't they just let pharmacies do it? I'm like, because that pharmacist isn't going to take the time to learn about each strain. It's like they're real. I mean, it, it, to be a good bartender, we have actually an article in this July issue coming out next week on, on good bartender practices. And, and it, it is difficult. I mean, there's anybody can be a quote unquote bud tender in the fact that yes, I can be at a retail shop 
you can buy cannabis from me. I can weigh it out and give it to you. Yes, anybody can do that part of it. But to be a good butt tender means that you need to be able to assess, okay, this is what this person's needs are. These are the strains that will work best for that needs. And you have to go through like whatever dispensary it is. It might have 100 plus different strains to choose from That's on so any true. given time. I don't see a pharmacist being able to do that. No, that you is a good I mean? point. That is a good um, point. So it, it, it's it, it's a bit of a conundrum for us in the cannabis industry. I, I completely agree with what you're saying. Yes, it is medical. It is something where a medical doctor should be able to do that. And yes, there's going to be like capsules and stuff like that that can help that. But when it comes to smoking or vaporizing cannabis, that that's not available. And, and a doctor's not going to take the time to learn it. They're not going to learn it. But what they will do is they'll document it in their patient files. Yeah. And True. so that right there is critical because, you know, there's the evidence and they can start documenting that and tracking that and then put their name and, you know, their MD behind it and be mm -hmm. like, this is the only thing that we added into their regimen. And this seems to be the only thing that has changed for the benefit. So, you know, if we have more data, because that was True. one of the things that was hurting us, you know, we had the entire psychological industry, everybody, it seemed, came out against it. And, you know, it just, <clears throat> they're so science-oriented. You know, I have a bachelor's in psychology. And um, that they, they really... <laughs> How many degrees do you have? <laughs> uh, just, just two right now. <laughs> just, I think school's addicting, but I think it, it can be. But, um, you know, they really, it's, everything has to be empirical. Everything has to be factual. There's, you know... No room for pseudoscience, like spirituality. You know, they, they may study, oh, the belief in something might make, you know, like have a placebo effect and then document that empirically. But it's all science, science, science. Right. And since there's not a lot of data on from schools that they went to, there's some data, but, you know, not a lot. Everything's anecdotal. They're still thinking at it from like that. Right that cap of, well, has it been empirically, you know, as opposed to, so that's frustrating. Well, we have to go on a break, but I want to okay. continue this conversation because it is a fascinating conversation. I like talking about the doctor side of thing, the medical side of like the mainstream medical community talking about cannabis and learning about it. So, yeah. so we'll be right back with Larissa Bolivar after, after this quick break. New things are here from Incredibles. Gummies. Our new gummies come two to a pack. Each two-pack contains 100 milligrams of the finest medicine around. What's more, each 50 milligram infused gummy disc is fortified with 100 milligrams of vitamin C for an extra healthful kick. Available in black cherry, green apple, orange, strawberry, blue raspberry, and strawberry banana. Gummies, new from Incredibles. Same great flavors, brand new shape, and now fortified with vitamin C. Canapunch is a delicious and effective medical marijuana beverage proudly made right here in Colorado. Each bottle is freshly infused with 100% pure flower extract from the highest grade marijuana plants available today. Using proprietary extraction methods, every bottle of Canapunch is consistently and reliably infused with an exact milligram dosage that you can count on to relieve your symptoms each and every time. Canapunch is delicious. There's never any medicine-y taste. We use only 100% cannabis flowers. No trim or byproducts are ever used in Canapunch. It does not require refrigeration and comes in convenient, resealable, multi-dose bottles from 60 milligrams to 200 milligrams we have drinks with dosage that works best for you can of punch is available in a variety of delicious flavors like black cherry watermelon pineapple mango and blue raspberry and we now have strain specific beverages available just for you can of punch is delicious convenient consistent and effective give it a try and experience the can of punch difference the Law Office of Edson Maiden and Matz provides criminal defense, family law, medical marijuana defense, and advice about setting up and running a medical marijuana center, optional premises cultivation operation, and infused product manufacturing businesses throughout the state of Colorado. We're focused on providing high quality service and customer satisfaction. We will do everything we can to meet your expectations. WarrenEdson.com, Edson Maiden and Matz in Denver, 303-831-8188, and in Aspen, 970-948-7183. Warren Edson. Com. I'm Gary Johnson, and you're listening to iCannabis Radio, and I want to say, talk it up, Colorado. Okay, we're back with the lovely Miss Larissa Bolivar, um, a student, activist, former dispensary owner. I, I could add, probably add a few more things, or you could probably add a few more things on there. Um, we were talking uh, before the break about um, mainstream <coughs> medical profession and how they're going to have to deal with cannabis. Um and, uh, you know, one of the things you were talking about is that, you know, they're like, well, where's the empirical evidence? And, and the, to me, the big thing is, is that 
you know, like there's a there's a perfect example. There's a um, there's a school right now that's wanting to do a study on epilepsy with uh, cannabis strains, mm-hmm. but they can't get them released from the University of Mississippi, which is the federal <laughs> home of cannabis research, um, because. Uh, Basically, all of the cannabis there is being used to study the negative benefits of mm-hmm. the, or the negative side effects of cannabis that they've been wasting all this cannabis they've been growing for years now <laughs> trying to find negative side effects, and they haven't really found many. Because mm-hmm. um, if they had found a lot, we would have heard a lot more about it. Oh, yeah. You know, the biggest ones that I can see that I believe are, and are, are, seem to be verified is, okay, if you're a habitual smoker when you're younger, and you might be breaking the mold on that one too, but if you're a habitual smoker when you're younger, you tend to – you might be able to lose – you might lose a little bit of your IQ – before you get older. Again, I'm not sure how they can quantify that really. Mm-hmm. Um, the thing with that and, you know, in, in their defense is that the human brain really doesn't stop developing until 21 and 25. Exactly. Yes. So yes. Ma- 20 for females, 25 for males. <laughs> we could... What are you trying to say? <laughs> and so I think that's what it is because I don't want to be raked across is? the coals over it. But you, for sure, ju- 21. You know what? You know what? No, because that's because we're like a really good chili. We just need more time to simmer because the longer it simmers on that pot, we taste better and better. That's, that's our brain. It. That's our brain. I think it might have something to do with blood flow and lack of blood flow to the brain for certain oh, parts they, of your life. Oh, but because like... it keeps going downhill. <laughs> like, yeah, I get it. I get it. That could be true. You never know. That I don't know. That's true. my theory. That's hey, what made sense. To most me. most like, guys oh. uh, up until they're about twenty uh, have a uh, you know uncontrollable blood flow other than their brain. So I, I that makes sense. You guys are suffocating. So. We're suffocating. <laughs> 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 you know what? I kind of believe that that could be a possibility, you know, because what, what, what's the, the thing that they did a study on men, especially at that age group, and, they, and they, they tried to figure out how often they thought about sex, and it was like every three seconds. Oh, my God. Yeah, every three surprising. seconds, a teenage boy thinks about sex. And I think for men, it's like every six seconds. But, you know, I every don't know. Every three seconds. Every three seconds a sexual thought is supposedly going through <laughs> their mind. Awesome. Obviously, they're averaging it out because I'm sure there's like <laughs> minutes at a time where they're, that's what they're thinking of. But uh, I think that's hysterical. I don't know if it's true and I don't know how you figure that out, but I still think it's funny. It is funny. Um, yeah, but funny. yeah, so you're right. I mean, there is a developmental side. So I believe, okay, well, there's some common sense there that makes sense that, okay, maybe, uh, you know, and when they're talking about habitual smoking, by the way, I guess that, I think they were talking about like five joints a day, you know, full joints that one Oops. person's smoking. Oops. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, that there are studies, but like then there's the studies, like there's the Drescher study out um, in Jamaica. Are you familiar with that one? No, I'm not. Um, this woman was hired. Mm-hmm. Uh, I forget her first name. Or Dreyer, Dreyer, D-R-E-H-E-R, I think it is, Dreyer. Um, She was hired to um, do a study in Jamaica on the effects of cannabis on mothers who use cannabis Mm. before and during um, pregnancy and then after while they're breastfeeding. And in Jamaica, obviously, and, and, and this is a, st- a study that's hard to do because there's very few women that would want to, especially right. at the time, would come out and be like, yes, yes. I do this. <laughs> um, although there's plenty of women that do because it helps with their cramps and, and, and you know, their um, nausea, nausea and everything. And, all that. Um, and so she did this study and it was a long-term study that was supposed to go on for like 20, 30 years. And after about 10 years, they canceled her funding somewhere around there. You have to, like, I, I, I'm giving kind of roundabout area uh-huh. of time. You have to like do, check it out. But they canceled her funding because she wasn't finding any negative side effects. Oh my gosh. So they canceled <laughs> it and they said, well, this study's no good because you're not finding any negative side effects. What? In fact, what she was finding was you know, evident. That sounds familiar. Sorry to yeah. holler into that. Yeah. But actually, I think I may have because yeah. that sounds familiar. And, and, but... and it's really the only study that's been done on a long term for um, p- mothers and kids who had cannabis in their systems while they were young um, as babies, as infants. And um, what they found was, uh, first of all, there was absolutely no negative side effects to the children. And what they also found was there was uh, a lot of evidence not enough to really say yes, but enough evidence to say these kids actually had higher than average IQs. They tended to be calmer um, and happier. <laughs> um, and, you know, we laugh about it happier, but at the same point, when you're talking about breast milk, um, you're talking about like one-tenth of one percent of cannabis 
that the mother's taking in going into the breast milk. But that's still cannabinoids that are actually helping their immune yeah. system. They tended to be healthier children and were sick less. Again, they were drinking breast milk, so that helps too. Yeah. Um, but there was, so what happened is they canceled their funding and she said, well, screw that. This is amazing. Yeah. I'm going to continue my study. And so she did continue the study. And, and what they found from this one study, and again, it's one study, um, was there was no negative side effects and po- in fact, possibly positive effects. Um, and, and that's what I want to kind of talk about is there's, you know, you have this, you know, the University of Mississippi, this, they have all this cannabis, but it's only for trying to find <laughs> negative side effects. And oh you keep God. hearing people saying, well, we don't have enough study on it. No, we have plenty of study on yeah. it. We have plenty of study that it doesn't do bad things. Right. What we don't, right. What we don't have enough study on is all of the positive things yeah. that it can do. And so when somebody's trying to do a positive study, they can't even get the cannabis to do it. Oh my gosh. I'm always like making that contrast in my papers. I'm mm-hmm. always pointing out in my arguments, mm-hmm. alcohol deaths, zero or yeah. marijuana deaths, excuse me, zero alcohol deaths, 88,000 a year. Like, yep. hello. Yep. The studies have shown one every six minutes. Yeah. One every alcohol. six minutes. So there's your evidence right there, yeah. you know, and then, you know, and then I draw, I, say the same thing that you do. Like, it's just, you know, there's enough evidence to say that it's not that harmful either. Yeah. And there, there is more evidence coming out now. Yeah, it couldn't on, hurt. It couldn't hurt. It couldn't hurt. It's like, <laughs> you know, I think that's the first <laughs> th- th- step you have to make is like, well, it, it can't hurt. Um, and then you find like you have issues like the VA with their scandal going on in the VA and, you know, all these patients that died because they couldn't get treated. And it's like, wow, how many of those patients may have been able to have been treated by cannabis on their own, mm-hmm. basically self-medicating because they didn't want to wait for the VA system and might have been doing better. I mean, we don't know what all the ailments that these people had, but if PTSD was one of them, um, yeah. you know, and to me, that's like really the real tragedy here is that we there are other states that do allow PTSD. Yes. And Michigan just allowed it, right? Recently? Yeah. Didn't yeah. They just- Arizona does it. Mm-hmm. I believe New Mexico has allowed it. I'm pretty sure Maine has as well. Uh, and then you have, you know, Colorado, which... If anybody's ever been down to Colorado Springs alone, is a huge. We're a huge military state. I mean, there are other military states, so it's not just us. But God, we have the Amer- the Air Force Academy. Mm-hmm. You have um, Fort NORAD. Carson. NORAD. <laughs> you know, that's a big one. Um, Fort Carson, Peterson Air Force Base. That alone um, is huge. Well, and then at Fort Cross- Carson, they recently had like a murder. Like some guy flipped out and killed mm-hmm. people. Mm-hmm. Was that just a few years ago? Yeah, that was just a few years ago. Yeah. Um, and. Yeah, so I mean, it's like, how are we ignoring our vets here? And and I don't understand when you say, what which politician was it that, uh, LeConte? Uh, no, LeConte no, no, is the clone Leconte. bar. <laughs> sorry, LeConte is the clone bar. Conte, sorry, Conte. <laughs> Representative Conte, Representative C-O-N-T-I. Yeah. And it, yeah, it was like very disappointing to see, you know, it, it was very disappointing. The, the emotions that I felt during that testimony and hearing other people testify are kind of hard to explain because... You know, there was a sense of resignation mm-hmm. um, and it, because it just seemed almost hopeless because of that reaction, you know, and it's not hopeless. You know, I really couldn't, you know, commend Representative Singer for coming out and, and pushing this uh, bill and, you know, getting the conversation started. Um, I think next year for sure it'll it'll happen just okay. because the outrage within the community. And I think that, you know, there'll probably be a lot of advocacy and lobbying efforts. Um, and, and talking to Representative Conti. And then, you know, if not, elections, are they always happen. <laughs> that, no, and, and is she up for re-election this, this November? And not this November, Bummer. I don't think so. Yeah, I don't, mm. you know, I don't know, yeah. Because, so. you know, it, it's one of those things that I, it's just almost like, conf- you know, I'm confounded by the fact that we have these politicians that are constantly trying to give, you know, respect to the vets. and Oh, we honor our vets, we honor our vets. And then they consistently ignore their needs. Yeah. And, and it's like, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, it, it's one of those things that drives me crazy in politics and in anything in general. It's like, you know what? People are defined by their actions, not what they say, but what they do mm-hmm. and how they follow through. Yeah. And I'm not seeing that follow through. I mean, you, you know, they, it's, it's literally like by your actions, you're basically flipping off vets. Yeah. That's oh, what it, you're doing. That's what you're doing. And there are people testifying. And I'm trying to remember because I think she's Jefferson County. If oh, that's wanna, my if county. people want to look up, that's I think I may be wrong. I don't think but, so. But um, yeah. Kathleen uh, Conti, C O N T I. Oh yeah, I'll it's really out. you know we really need to start holding our representatives accountable mm-hmm. on how they believe and and their and you know their positions on marijuana because voters voted for this. <laughs> it's like you know, this is you know in Denver it was almost mandated because sixty six percent. But um, it, you know just the fact that there are veterans, you know, sitting there testifying and then people. 
you know, with PTSD or um, uh, professionals that were on our side, professionals that, you know, were in combat and Mm -hmm. in the most intense situations and conflict, you know, chasing down Saddam Hussein. I remember when they found him. I did too. You know, I mean, that's, you know, ignoring their testimony and then talking to a doctor that's only looked at research data and perhaps talked to a couple uh, veterans who were already addicted to other drugs because it is self-medicating. I met a lot of veterans who who and, were, you know, addicts that um, marijuana saved their lives, not only because of PTSD, but because of their addiction. So I want to know, who's bringing these doctors up? Like, who's the one? Like, I, I understand there are groups that are advocates for cha- getting PTSD on the register finding. Okay, let's find doctors who have done research. Let's find the vets who have PTSD who say it helps. You And you have you know, oh. empirical evidence on that. Who are the people that are bringing these other doctors who have done no research besides searching online for the research they want to find? Who, is, who are the ones bringing those people forward? Uh, the Colorado Department of Health and uh, Environment, Public Health and Environment, CDPHD, and Dr. Larry Wolk. Yeah. Yeah. And he hates cannabis. Yeah. He, he's on the camp. Oh, they can just go buy it. Who cares? Who cares? And he's trying to do away, you know, with, you know, with they just had their um, their changes in their town hall. And, you know, they are trying they were trying to push to limit uh, plant numbers to begin with. They, you know, he thinks that one plant is fine. And, you know, one plant, one plant. One yeah. Plant. Yeah. Because oh, okay. he's the expert. Gotcha. It's all gotcha. somebody dug up dirt on him. Um, and it was, you know, it, this article was passed, you know, through Facebook. But uh, apparently he used to be. Or he still is part of a company that does health care for prisons. Mm-hmm. So there's no biasness there. Oh, no, none at none all. None at all. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> wow. Um, These are the people that we're dealing with. It's all, it, I just, you know, what was that movie where everybody stuck their head out of the window and screamed, I'm mad as hell? Network. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like doing sorry. That did I often. jump on that too fast? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I'm very familiar with it. Great movie. Anybody who's never seen it's either Network or the. I think it's just Network. It might the be network. the Network, but I think it's the Network. Um, <laughs> it, it's it's amazing because it was like 30, almost 40 years ago. Yeah, now. I think it was 40 years ago now. Yeah, and uh, it's amazing how it still speaks to today. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> It, yeah, it, 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 yeah. I'm mad as hell. And I'm not, not gonna, gonna take, take it, it anymore. Because I'm like, really, people. You don't see. You know, you don't see this. You don't see that there's bias. You don't see that there's you know self interest. Of course, doctors are gonna pr- you know protect the pharmaceutical industry. That's the that's a gravy train. Yeah. You know, yeah. and we're at the mercy are the consumers, mm-hmm. and you know we're the ones that are suffering from you know 80 years of failed policy, yeah. arguably 40 years of failed drug war. Because you know honestly, if if you know, I don't. I'm not saying everybody should go out and do heroin because I'm not. You know, I, I, at first, for the longest time, I was very anti-legalized hard drugs, mm. but now that I'm finishing my degree and I'm doing research, you know, on prohibition in general and the impacts, and you know, I read this great book by Mark Thornton called mm. "The Economics of Prohibition." Mm-hmm. Oh my God, that book was such an eye opener because it just, it was like, you know, and I had to write a paper where I mirrored marijuana prohibition and cannabis prohibition. And so it really just. You mean alcohol prohibition? Or I mean alcohol prohibition. What did I say? You said marijuana and cannabis. cannabis. (laughs) That's all right. (laughs) So, you know, I had to mirror them and like, I was like, oh my gosh. It's it's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. And it creates, you know, terrible incentives. And Mm -hmm. you can see that visually if you want to look at pictures of the Mexican drug war. I don't Mm -hmm. want that happening there or here, you know, and that's what's going to happen. It's going to escalate and escalate. You know, you can't keep pumping money into something and it not work and and continue with that policy. Something has to give. So, Well, the reason why they do it is because somebody's getting paid. Oh, a lot of people are getting paid. Exactly. Exactly. A lot of people are getting paid. And yeah, prisons is a perfect example. Yeah. You know, they're not happy here in Colorado. (laughs) Any privatized prison in Colorado, and I don't know how many there are here, they're not happy right now. What I, like... Privatized prisons, like what isn't that insane? Is that? How I mean, I, like... it, it's amazing to me, <laughs> you know. I mean, when you talk about that Republican agenda, like, oh no, government doesn't work. Well, then why are you part of government? Yeah. You know? So what you're saying is you don't work. You don't work. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, to me, I, I'm f- I'm all for free market and capitalism. You know, I, I already got some flack about that in my last issue, and I said we want a true capitalist society. I was talking about um, why would why would the medical community actually accept and embrace cannabis? 
you know, as a possible potential cure for for cancer, for right. example. Why would they do that? They make way more money on. I mean, that's cannabis is cheap. Yeah. Um, that's, and, and that's always people and, have always felt that. And way. someone's like, "Oh, well, you anti capitalism?" I'm like, "No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm just I I believe in common sense capitalism." And there's a point when profit shouldn't be the end goal. And to me, it's always if you're profiting off somebody else's pain, mm-hmm. then it shouldn't be a for profit business. I call that conscious capitalism, yes. which is an actual movement. It is an actual movement, and conscious it, capitalism. And I think it's very possible. I yeah. mean, imagine a world where instead of con- competing and tearing down people, that you're actually empowering people. And mm-hmm. they still have their level. You know, you, you're not going to have, you know, somebody coming out of high school do surgery. But, you know, they may work at McDonald's or whatever, but they're being empowered to cultivate their, you know, entrepreneurship or you know just really elevating people to that next level yeah. the the form of capitalism that we have now is keeps it it's very destructive and we're seeing that and now it's the in ayn rand form of capitalism yeah really. and it it's is. amazing that there's this huge movement going back to ayn rand and it's like but there's no compassion there there's no compassion you're taking humanity out of capitalism and i think that's a mistake it's a huge mistake humans are social creatures and you know i have a very strong libertarian streak but that's Mm -hmm. where i start separating from that party because you know i know that humans need each other Mm -hmm. you know if we if we tear each other down we're going to get a third world nation and that's what's happening now we're getting a very you know controlling government you know they're militarizing the police everybody's defending the corporations nobody's defending the people and it's not even not even at a populist level is i'm not talking about populism and and you know right. that i'm talking about just ethical behavior so if we actually started empowering people imagine how much better that world would be i would prefer to live in that world than one that's constant destruction well there's an even further movement um i think i talked about it a long time ago on here um that i'm still unsure of how it would work but it sounds like this great utopian ideal called a resource-based economy i don't know if you've heard of this one um uh, i recommend anybody check out the venus project and they can check out um, yeah that's good yeah and and it's really an amazing idea it sure is the only way it could happen is in a total global economic collapse and somebody comes in and goes we have this option you know but um but i i mean I like the thought process behind it. It would we'd have to basically tear down all the walls of you know social, social, economic, global relationships that we have, and kind of say, okay, if we could reinvent how the human global society works now, mm-hmm. how would we do it? And right. that would be like a great way to look at it. Um, but I believe you know being conscious capitalism makes a lot of sense. Well, and that also means you know because you know I'm talking about empowering others, but so that listeners can really understand what it is, is being, is social responsibility as well. Mm -hmm. So being accountable to the consumer and to the person that makes your business so. Yeah. And that's a big deal. Yeah. And so, you know, I I totally stand behind that. Cannabis Consumers Union is going to stand behind businesses that operate that way. And businesses should be aware if they don't operate that way, they will be called out. Um, And have you been doing that so far? uh, Yeah, I don't know if you want me to talk about it on the radio show, but yeah, you know, we've had... Uh, a threat of a Montana, uh, former Monsanto executive, you know, uh, I've be appointed just, to I a board. Just, I just found this out recently, and I'm probably going to get in trouble because I, I, you know, I'd rather not say who it is right now because I want to clarify personally myself before I speak about it. Yeah, I don't um, want to force the conversation. There was it's uh, very controversial. There, no, there's a company that is associated with Monsanto that was at the Cannabis Business Summit. Not a dispensary. Interesting. Um, and I spoke in the letter to the readers that's coming out in this next issue. I, I did touch on that. And I'm like, uh, why are we even accepting a company like that into this mix? If they're connected to Monsanto. Now, you can make the argument if you're a company who has somebody who is a former employee of Monsanto coming in that maybe they're not involved in Monsanto anymore. And maybe they've change their ways and you know we can't go after that person i'm not saying that that's the case i don't know what the case is yet so i don't want to speak too much about it yet um but look if i find out that you know oh no this is a real deal i mean i've already made some phone calls to try to find out and i haven't heard back yet yeah Um, it's something that i'm actively working on i I got it and 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 i've and i've already i just found out it was funny because we submitted this letter and somebody's like oh they're gonna think you're talking about them i'm like i didn't even know about that (laughs) but my opinion is still my opinion. Yeah. And uh, Monsanto needs to be kept kept out of this industry. Yes. You know, and that was one of the things I said is we have a unique um, advantage 
being this new industry yes. that has potential to be huge. We can be ethical. We can be ethical. Oh, and we can that. And we can look at like, okay, how, what were some bad agricultural practices yeah. of the last century? How can we make sure that that doesn't happen? And in a way, I feel like it's more, not, not as much on the cannabis side of things, on the marijuana side, I should say, but more on the hemp side of things. Because now we are talking about mass agriculture and you're talking about farmers dealing with that. We definitely want to keep companies like Monsanto out of the mix of that. Um, or And I think companies like chemical companies like DuPont, anybody associated yep. to any of their companies, even, and I may be a hardliner on this, but I would say even past uh, connections only because 80 years of people ruin, having their lives ruined. Yes. And I think to have anybody with that kind of background, and this is going to sound so extreme, is to kind of be putting Hitler in a position of running a hospital. You know, it's just like... <laughs> that is extreme. You, you, could, but, you could have 20 years of forgiveness and penance, but then nothing changes the fact that your personality trait was one, that you could do so much great evil because there are pathological behaviors. And I say that as somebody who has studied psychology. Mm -hmm. There are pathological sure. behaviors. And if that is ingrained in somebody, if somebody just has a sociopathic tendency, that doesn't change overnight. I, I, I would not disagree so, with you. But I, I mean, I can't say that everybody that works for Monsanto is a sociopath. No. I, you know, some people are just working for the money. Yeah. You know, I mean, it is no, what it no, is. No, I no, don't, I don't think so. But I think that people who cover up, uh, you know, chemical spills and poison people yes. until they get in trouble about totally it. Totally agree. That, that to me, I don't care who you are. You know what I mean? Like, it, the only time I think that murder is okay is in absolute self-defense. Absolutely. And, you know, to poison people to make money mm -hmm. is evil. And then to spend millions of dollars to cover it up. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. I agree. So, you know, and they've basically, Monsanto has basically done a hostile takeover on American farmers. On, they're trying to do a hostile takeover on everything, it mm -hmm. seems. Like, they mm -hmm. bought they bought Blackwater. What the hell do they need? Black water. Yeah, really. For. What do they need black water for? <laughs> I mean, literally, they are literally the. They have to be the most evil corporation in the world. <laughs> I, I I would agree with you on that, and I and I'm very strongly opinion about Monsanto as a company. I can't pick on a, specific individuals in Monsanto unless they've been spokesman and, and everything. So I don't know yeah. enough about this individual to speak about them. Yeah. Um. And and that's where at me as a media avenue works on being responsible. Even though I've had somebody yeah. come after me once saying, "Well, you know, you're not." Uh, unbiased media source. I'm like, no, of course we're not. We're a cannabis publication. Yeah. You know, like, well, you don't talk about the negative side effects. I'm like, no, we do. There's just not a lot. There's just not a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, you know, because I make fun of, I, I bust on the media all the time. And people are like, well, how can you bust on them and you're biased? I'm like, because we're niche media. <laughs> they're mainstream media. And yeah. their job is to be as unbiased well, as possible. Well, you're supposed to support cannabis. That's you know, much. But yeah, in exactly. other, you're right. In other media issues, and I, and I have done, you know, I have written for publications and I respect that. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and in school, I have to be absolutely, absolutely unbiased. So I respect that completely. And so, you know, and, and people should always, critically think on everything mm -hmm. and any decision that they make so yeah but yeah you're a cannabis radio that's exactly duh. it's like a, yeah, <laughs> I always, it always crazy i'm like what did you think was going to happen just do you think cigar aficionado is talking about the dangers of tobacco usage no no they're not um so yeah it, it doesn't make a lot of sense. No, it uh, you know, we have to wrap up. It's right. great talking to you, by the way. It is great um, talking we definitely to you. want to have you come back on. Yeah. Um, fun. And uh, how can people find out and kind of and become a part of the Cannabis Consumers Union? We have a Facebook page. Okay. It's Cannabis Consumers Union. Um, they can find me, Larissa Bolivar, on uh, Facebook. Um, and then our website is cannabisconsumer.org. So there, uh, there's a Cannabis Consumers which is plural.org. That is not us. That's that some other. You. We are cannabis consumer, I mean, individual. Gotcha. Com. Okay. Yeah. So cannabis consumer, the individual. <laughs> All right. Um, and again, cannabis consumers union mm -hmm. on Facebook. On Facebook. Um, so you can uh, check out what Larissa is working on because it's always something. You, gotta, <laughs> you know, you like me, you have a lot of pots in the fire all yeah. the time. Yeah. Um, well, like, again, a real pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us. It was um, a pleasure being on know, the show. I wish you a happy Independence Day tomorrow. You too. Um, and uh, we'd like to thank our sponsor, Incredibles, for being incredible. And uh, by the way, Best treat ever for uh, campfires, if you're doing that for 4th of July camping. Incredible s'mores with a <laughs> boulder bar. That is the shit. That sounds really good. It's really good. It's really <laughs> good. But, you know, hey, it's a lot of dosage, so be careful. Um, so thanks for listening to us. Thank you, Incredibles. Thank you, Larissa. And Thank you, uh, peace, love, and hempiness.